Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cutrate Commander, the series where we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at a build featuring the descend focused fungus, the Myco Tyrant. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content, and if you really like it, do please consider supporting the channel directly either through Buy Me A Coffee or through our Game Nerds affiliate links in the description. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see what commander builds we'll be covering next. So, with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. The Myco Tyrant is a Star Star Elder Fungus with Trample that costs 1 and Golgari that has the following two abilities. Firstly, its power and toughness are equal to the number of fungus and sapperling creatures we control. And secondly, on our end step, we create X 1 1 black fungus creature tokens with This Creature Can't Block, where X is equal to the number of times we descended that turn. Breaking down its core stats, the Myco Tyrant possesses a lower mid-weight CMC, a variable power and toughness that scales off the number of fungi and sapperlings we have in play, alongside built-in trample to more easily allow it to crash through blockers once it gets big enough, and a pair of abilities that combine to grow itself and our board into a bigger and bigger threat each turn, so long as we're able to keep filling up our bin with permanence. Taking a closer look at its second ability first, since it's the one that will be enabling the Myco Tyrant's entire game plan, it functions as a powerful descend payoff that enables the Myco Tyrant to absolutely flood the board with bodies as we send a permanence to our bin through any means. Now, at surface level, this can function as a delayed on death payoff as our non token creatures are naturally destroyed or as we sack them away for value, but as we delve deeper, we'll find we can also take advantage of self sacking permanence, fetch lands, self mill sources, self discard sources, and graveyard tutors to get even more mileage out of it, easily allowing us to fill up our grave to the brim so we can in turn churn out gigantic swarms of fungi each rotation. That said, there are a few notable weaknesses regarding this ability. Firstly, the tokens it creates cannot screen attacks for us since they can't block, making them entirely offense-oriented, which as 1-1s isn't ideal, but seeing as we can easily replenish their number each turn with enough graveyard loading effects, and that Golgari has a solid selection of on-death payoffs to take advantage of our tokens dying if they are blocked, we can still certainly make good use of them despite this. And secondly, since this ability procs on our end step, our opponents do have the opportunity to just remove the Myco Tyrant to prevent its token creation altogether. Now, while this certainly can be annoying, we can actually play around it. You see, just because the Myco Tyrant leaves play doesn't mean that our quote-unquote descend count goes away. Meaning, if we can get it back onto the battlefield before the end of our turn, our opponents will either need to remove it again or we get our tokens anyway. Which we can easily accomplish by either recasting our commander from the command zone, or instead by reanimating it or recurring it from our bin via the multitude of ways our colors have at their disposal. Now, to be fair, our opponents can just wait until the end of our main 2 to remove it, thereby preventing us from resummoning it before our end step, but this will become harder and harder to do as our commander grows in size thanks to its second ability, putting our opponents in a position in which they either have to choose to potentially take a huge amount of commander damage as it swings into them in order to prevent its token creation, or removing it in the combat phase to prevent that damage but letting us get the token creation anyway once we bring it back into play, with that first option becoming harder and harder to justify as the game goes on and our commander grows in size. So, as we can see based on its abilities, the Myco Tyrant is a commander that's all about getting permanence into our bin in order to grow our board with tokens and then in turn itself. So it only makes sense to enable that growth as much as we can by going all in on permanence in our 99, and ways to reliably get those permanence into our graveyard by any means necessary. Now, while there is admittedly no actual need for our main deck to be permanence all the way down, seeing as there are some very powerful non-permanent spells that can fuel our graveyard-centric game plan quite nicely, we'll be running plenty of permanent sources of self-mill to get cards into our bin from our deck, self-discard to get them out of our hands, and self-sack to get them off the field without the need to run quote-unquote duds that won't proc our commander if they hit our bin. 
leaving us with more room to add in ways to recur and reanimate our resources from the bin, effectively turning our graveyard into a second, much larger hand for us to play from, and ways to weaponize our tokens to make them as deadly as their progenitor as they swing in, enabling the Myco Tyrant and his brood of Mycoids to grow in number and strength until they overwhelm, consume, and assimilate our opponents. So let us make our way just off the coast of High and Dry on the plain of Ixalan, the base of operations for the Brazen Coalition, where we'll find a ship approaching its port. But, unbeknownst to them, this particular ship contained on it a new host for the parasitic hive mind, the Myco Tyrant. With its former primary body and its forces destroyed in its battle against the Altex and their allies, a new approach was now required for it to spread and assimilate. A slower, stealthier approach that would succeed where brute force had previously failed. And, with enough time and care, everyone would succumb. Everything would be joined. Everything would be won under its influence. All that it required was time and patience, qualities it possessed in abundance. After a millennia of being sealed away, what was a few more years of hiding if it meant this entire world's assimilation? So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Opening with the backbone of our deck, that being its ability to get permanence into our bin in order to enable our commander's token creation, we'll be starting off with a series of creatures whose primary function will be to send cards from our deck field and hand into our graveyard in order to do just that. So, beginning with our self-milling entrance, we'll be running some repeatable sources of self-mill in the form of Milliken and Skull Prophet, both of whom speed up our mana base while either simultaneously or giving us the option to mill ourselves. Bramble Familiar, which in the early game is a serviceable mana dork, but in later turns, we can return it back to our hand by pitching a card to recast it for its adventure side, milling us seven, netting us one of the milled cards, and setting itself up to do so again later. Nyx Weaver, which passively mills us on our upkeep and then gives us the option to exile it to recur a card from our bin back to hand, making it the first of our many graveyard recursion sources. Splinter Fright, which serves as another source of passive mill that also takes advantage of our bin, this time by empowering itself as we get creatures into it so it can swing in alongside our commander as another massive trampling beat stick and World Shaper, which mills us as it swings in, and, upon death, allows us to put any lands in our graveyard into play tapped, making it both solid at enabling our primary descend game plan, and then taking advantage of it with its mass land reanimation to provide a huge amount of ramp. Then moving on to some legendary sources of repeatable mill, we'll be adding Shigeki Jukai Visionary to our ranks as a self-mill source that, while slow, typically land ramps us to speed up our mana base, and, later, can be used as a way to recur multiple non-legendary cards from our bin thanks to his channel. Old Rutstein as a passive source of mill that also nets us resources in the form of extra bodies via insect tokens, self-discard via blood tokens, or ramp via treasure tokens as he mills us for extra value. Kaga Shadow Archdruid as an unattack source of mill that A is both hard to block thanks to her unattack death touch, making it easier to proc her mill, and B allows us to cast a permanent or play a land we mill each turn to help generate us additional value from our bin, and lastly, Boren Klex, whose front face may not mill us, though it is still useful as an overstatted trampling body that helps us make our land drops, but whose back face, the Grand Evolution, immediately nets us 10 descend triggers for the Myco Tyrant and reanimates two bodies from those 10 milled cards to build up our board with, on top of permanently empowering our commander and other creatures with counters and turning them into repeatable fight-based removal with its other chapters, after which it returns back to its front face so we can do it all over again. Now, staying on the self-mill game plan but pivoting more towards less repeatable sources of it, we'll be running the Dredge Creatures, Stinkweed Imp, Golgari Thug, and Golgari Grave Troll, all of which can take advantage of being sent to the bin by milling us even more as they return themselves back to our hand, with the latter two also being decent Graveyard Matters payoffs via the recursion and resilient scalable stat block they provide, 
Circle of the Land Druid, Seder Wayfinder, and Undead Butler, each of which provide ETB Mill and a Graveyard Recursion on top of that for added Graveyard value, with the first two recurring a land back to our hand and the latter recurring a creature, and lastly, Acolyte of Affliction, which again mills on ETB, but this time returns any permanent from our grave back to hand when it comes down, giving us access to our entire graveyard for added consistency. Then switching gears from creatures who send cards from our deck to the bin and onto those that send them from the field instead, we'll be running the AoE Edict creatures Fleshbag Marauder, Merciless Executioner, Demon's Disciple, Plague Crafter, and Grave Lighter, all of whom will typically be sacking away as soon as they come down to disrupt all our opponent's boards, but we can occasionally use to send another creature we want to recur and or reanimate to the bin instead. Foundation Breaker and Shriek Maw, which we can cast at a discount thanks to Evoke to use them as sorcery speed spot removal for back row and creatures respectively while increasing our descend count, Caustic Caterpillar and Canker Bloom, both of which we can have sit on the board as potential sources of back row removal until we need to use them, their threat of activation often being more effective than the removal itself, and, of course, Sakura Tribelder as the poster child of self-sacking creatures to provide staple land-based ramp to our build while fueling our descend-focused game plan. So, now that we've more or less covered the creatures that will be setting up our bin to enable the Myco Tyrant's Descend, let's switch our focus onto the creatures we'll be using to recur cards from our bin so we can generate value from it. With Eternal Witness, Timeless Witness, Golgari Findbroker, and Kawadi Scavenger all making it into the build as ETB sources of recursion for any of our permanents that can be recurred or reanimated themselves to get extra uses out of them, making them superb at fetching up the most powerful cards from our bin whenever we may need them, as well as Genesis, which provides repeatable creature recursion while it's in our graveyard, allowing us to simply dump it into our bin and then leave it there to passively give us the option to recur our creatures if and when we need them. Creatures like the ones we'll be using to convert our token creation into damage in order to make our swarm of fungi as dangerous as their progenitor, such as Ayara First of Lockthwain, who turns all our tokens into AoE drain as they come down, easily enabling us to take huge chunks out of our opponent's life totals while padding our own just by creating tokens, while also serving as a decent source of repeatable sack-based draw to provide us with card advantage and increase our descend count, Mirkwood Bats, which instead turns our fungus tokens into AoE burn as we create them and as we sacrifice them, which we have multiple ways to do so individually and one mass way to do so to get even more damage out of them. And last, but certainly not least, Dreadhound and Sir Conrad the Grim, which are arguably our most potent damage dealers as they not only inflict AoE burn as our tokens die off, but also as we mill creatures from our deck, thereby turning all our self-mill sources into AoE burn as well to burn our opponents out even faster. And that's on top of also fueling our descend-focused game plan with the self-mill they bring to the table, and the latter being able to inflict even more damage as we pitch cards from hand and recur creatures from our bin. And then reaching the end of our creature base, we'll be adding in a handful of creatures that either are or can produce fungus and or sapperling tokens to build up our board presence and our commander's stat block outside of its ability. Those being Mycoloth, whose Devour 2 can convert all our fungus tokens into stats for itself while procking all our on-death slash on-sacrifice damage dealing effects, and, if it survives a full rotation, then passively produces double the number of tokens worth of sapperlings each turn to build up our board and empower our commander even faster, Nimada Primeval Warden, who passively creates sapperlings for us as our opponent's creatures die off, and also serves as solid graveyard hate by exiling those creatures, on top of giving us a way to to turn those sapperlings into draw if needed, and a spore crowned thalid, which functions as a fungus and sapperling lord to turn our wide board of fungi into tutus and give the myco tyrant a plus two plus two stat bump as well so we can crack in for even more damage. That covers all our creatures, and since we won't be running any instants or sorceries, let's skip straight on to our enchantments. Returning back to our sources of descend as we enter our enchantment category, we'll be adding in some additional sources of repeatable self-mill into our arsenal to help keep the flow of cards going into our bin nice and high for our commander. 
such as crawling infestation and crawling sensation, each of which mill us for two each turn and help build up our board with insect tokens as we mill creatures and lands respectively, crop sigil, which mills us for one each turn, and, once we have enough permanent types in our bin, we can sack to use as creature and land recursion if we need to, cemetery tampering, which mills us for three each turn and nets us a free spell off hideaway once we have 20 plus cards in our bin, which will happen quite quickly in this build, and Out of the Tombs, which pulls double duty in this build as both a mill source that scales up by two with each passing turn to help us get more and more cards into our bin, and, once we run out of cards to mill, not only prevents us from drawing from that point forward so we don't lose the game, but also becomes a repeatable source of creature reanimation when we would draw to weaponize our entire graveyard. And speaking of weaponizing our graveyard, we'll also be running Deadbridge Chant, whose mill 10 on ETB is superb at taking up our descent count, but we'll be primarily running for the free creature reanimation slash card recursion it provides us with each passing turn after that, to net us passive value from our bin from that point forward as well as the saga The War in Heaven, which initially serves as a source of card advantage to help pad our core stats, but whose latter chapters provide self-mill and creature reanimation to fuel our primary game plan, after which it sacks itself away to add to our descent count and to where it could potentially be recurred. Then staying on the topic of sagas for a moment, as they fit nicely into our build as permanents that naturally sack themselves away, we'll be running two more in this build in the form of One Ring to Rule Them All, who self-mill, board wipe, and AoE burn on a relatively easy to recur permanent, fits very nicely into this build as both a core stat and game plan improving piece, as does Binding the Old Gods, which again helps pad our core stats via the removal and land ramp it provides, while also helping us get extra mileage out of our swarm of fungi by granting them all death touch for a turn, forcing our opponents to either block and lose creatures to them, or not block and take a huge chunk of damage. And then, as one last self-sacking enchantment, we'll also be slotting in Font of Fertility, which functions as a green-flavored Wayfarer's Bobble to help us speed up and fix our mana base while it ticks up our descend count. We'll then be adding Oversold Cemetery to our build as an additional source of repeatable recursion, whose 4 plus creatures in our graveyard condition is laughably easy for our build to meet, and provides a manless way to repeatedly recur a creature from our graveyard each turn, thereby ensuring that our most powerful creatures won't stay dead for long. And finally, as our last two enchantment entries, we'll be adding in Growing Rights of Itlamok, whose recent reprint has lowered its price enough to be included as initially a creature-based cantrip that quickly transforms into Itlamok, Cradle of the Sun, a fantastic source of ramp that scales off the number of creatures we have in play, providing us with all the mana we'll ever need alongside the Myco Tyrant's token creation, as well as Moldervine Reclamation, which provides simple but effective card advantage and life gain as our creatures die off, including our tokens, helping us keep our cards in hand and life totals nice and high. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. It's then back to descend pieces yet again as we enter our artifact category in an effort to enable the Myco Tyrant as much as we can, starting off with some more self-mill in the form of Mesmeric Orb, which turns every permanent we untap into mill, including our lands, so we can fill up our bin at a breakneck pace, Perpetual Timepiece, which more or less functions as a mill 2 per turn, and, if we're about to deck ourselves, can also be used as an emergency way to reload our deck with cards from our bin in order to keep us from doing so, and Codex Shredder, which functions as a cheap mill 1 initially that we can later sack away to return anything from our bin back to hand, enabling both the self-mill and graveyard recursion parts of our game plan. Then moving on to artifacts that can sack themselves or other permanents for value, we'll be running Wayfarer's Bobble as a simple piece of land-based ramp to build up our mana base with, as it sends itself to our bin to increase our descent count for the turn, and Atarian's Journal, which starts off as a slow but free once per turn sack outlet to turn our creatures into card advantage that, later, we can transform into Tomb of Aklazots by pitching our hand, netting us even more descent triggers while doing so, and then giving us the means to cast our creatures from the bin with finality counters on them, which admittedly only works once for each creature, but is still a solid way for us to get creatures back that we're not worried about permanently losing anyway. 
And then as our final descent enabling artifact, we have Matsalanti the Great Door, which starts off as a free once per turn loot effect to help us fill up our bin while we dig for more resources that, once we have four types of permanence in our bin, we can transform into the core, a land that taps for mana equal to the number of permanents we have in our graveyard, making it more than capable of tapping for 10, 20, or even 30 plus mana once we have enough cards in our bin to ensure that mana generation won't be an issue for the rest of the game. And then with our Descent-focused artifacts covered, we'll be adding in Conduit of Worlds as one last way to make use of the cards we'll be sending to our bin, as it passively allows us to play lands from our graveyard to ensure we can make our land drops, and, if we forgo casting any other spells for the turn, lets us cast a permanent spell from our graveyard, which can slow down our casting when we use it, but does give us access to our entire graveyard as a second hand for us to cast from, so it's generally worth the trade-off. And then as one final source of fungi to help empower our commander, we have Skullspore Nexus, which we can generally cast for only two thanks to our commander's scalable stat block, and attacks on on-death fungus token creation onto all our non-token creatures that scales off of their combined power, making it a great way to combat against removal and wipes, or just get extra value off of our creatures as we sack them away, while also serving as a once per turn instant speed power doubler, easily taking the Myco Tyrant into one-shot range, or, in response to removal, netting us a twice as strong fungus token as compensation. Then at last, reaching the end of this category, we'll be slotting in some core stat improving entrants to help pad those numbers. Those being Soul Ring and Arcane Signet, as almost auto include ramp staples to help build up our mana base with, and Skull Clamp as a cheap and efficient way to turn our excess fungus tokens into card advantage for one mana a pop, while triggering all our other on death payoffs. That covers all our artifacts, so let's move on to our land base. Starting off with the lands we'll be running to net ourselves one last wave of Descend triggers, we have Evolving Wilds, Terramorphic Expanse, and Riveter's Outlook, all being slow fetches to help fix our mana base for added consistency while increasing our Descend count for the turn to fuel our commander, Myriad Landscape and Blighted Woodland, which provide us with Land Ramp instead as they sack themselves away to speed up and fix our mana base, Grim Backwoods, which gives us access to a creature sacrificing source of card advantage from our land slot that, while expensive to activate, is still nice to have access to if we really need the draw, and a deck more salvage, whose dredge 2 always gives us the option to mill ourselves instead of drawing while it's in our bin in case we want a higher descend count or just really need to make that land drop. Then, as some more typical mana lands, we'll be slotting in Command Tower, Lanawar Wastes, Necroblossom Snarl, and Tainted Wood into the build, as lands that either always or usually come into play untapped while tapping for both of our colors, providing the build with reliable access to said colors without sacrificing speed while doing so. And then as our lone utility land, we have Bajuka Bog, which functions as a solid silver bullet to combat against other graveyard-focused builds and ensure that the only player getting value out of their bin is us. And finally, we'll be running 12 swamps and 12 forests as our basics to close out our land base. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 40 creatures including our commander, 0 instants, 0 sorceries, 13 enchantments, 11 artifacts, 0 planeswalkers, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 31 sources of mill, 22 cards that can sack themselves or others, 4 sources of self-discard, 27 cards that care about cards being or being sent to our graveyard, 22 sources of recursion and or reanimation, 4 fungus creatures, 4 sources of sapperling and or fungus tokens, and 4 ways to convert our tokens into burn, leaving us with a final build with plenty of ways to enable our commander's descend focused game plan, generate value from the cards we'll be sending to the bin, and even a handful of ways to get even more fungi and sapperlings into play to build up our board, empower our commander and convert into damage. For general deck stats, we have 15 ramp sources, 8 card draw sources, 11 targeted removal sources, and 1 board wipe. Our draw being slightly below average in this build due to us generating most of our value from our graveyard, while our other stats fall within more typical ratios. 
Then looking at our mana curve, we have 7 1 drops, 16 2 drops, 19 3 drops, 11 4 drops, 7 5 drops, 3 6 drops, and 1 8 drop. Leaving us with a mid-weight curve that wants to make a beeline for our commander as quickly as possible, followed by self-milling, self-sacking, and self-discarding sources to get our descend game plan rolling. Then from there, it's just a matter of continuing to fill up our bin with cards so the Micro Tyrants can keep building up our board and therefore itself, allowing it and its progeny to crash into our opponents turn after turn, whittling down their resources and life totals while we simply recur our resources from the grave, until our rapidly spreading fungal infection inevitably consumes them. Currently this deck is valued at 6482, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, we can consider replacing Golgari Find Broker with Skyfisher Spider to give us access to more on-theme spot removal we can recur over additional recursion sources. One Ring to Rule Them All can be swapped out for Marin of Clan Nil Toth if we'd rather not run wipes in favor of additional ways to repeatedly recur or reanimate our creatures, and Vorinclex can be benched in favor of Underrealm Lich if we'd rather have access to a more immediate and consistent source of mill rather than the explosive but mana-intensive mill and recursion of its predecessor. Then for upgrades, we can cut Kawadi Scavenger for Jahira, Friend of the Forest, who turns all our fungus tokens into mana dorks to considerably speed up our mana base. Binding of the Old Gods can be traded out for Blossoming Tortoise, which sets up our grave better via its ETB and on attack mill while reanimating our lands from the bin to ramp us. And, provided we're also willing to overhaul our mana base, Font of Fertility can be replaced with Hermit Druid, which can mill us an insane amount in one shot to rack up our descend count if we're able to cut the number of basics we're running. And while on the topic of improving our mana base, we can always consider terraforming one of our forests into Gaia's Cradle, which again takes advantage of our wide board states to ensure we'll have access to all the mana we'll ever need. Though you may have some issues explaining to your friends and family that all your land investments got you was a 2.5 by 3.5 inch plot that you can carry with you. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Firstly, before we continue, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the channel subscribers for having helped the channel reach its 16.9k subscriber milestone. It's all thanks to your continued support that this channel keeps growing, so sincerely, thank you. Now, with the Myco Tyrant covered, our upcoming commander builds will be featuring the discard-focused Bat God, Aklazot's Deepest Betrayal, followed by the Precon Upgrade Guides for the Murders at Karlov Manor commander decks, so look forward to those coming soon. And lastly, before we close out, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel can't continue to grow without your support. And if you're feeling particularly generous, feel free to keep me caffeinated via buying me a coffee at the link in the description, or alternatively, use our Game Nerds affiliate link in the description if you're looking to purchase sealed MTG product, accessories, board games, or any of their other wide selection of products at low prices that include free shipping for orders over $75, and a rewards program that builds up store credit over time as you make your purchases. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.